Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we're oh. very happy to Can have just a, one. Oh, or, yeah. Uh, yeah, oh, I see. Okay, yeah. okay. Uh, very happy to have today uh, Parsifal um, de Sola Avadrado. And uh, he's the founder and CEO of a Fondacion um, Andreas Bello in Bogota, Colombia. But Parsifal's uh, relationship with the uh, Weatherhead East Asia Institute at Columbia University goes back more than 10 years ago when he was an MA student of East Asian studies at this institute in a class of uh, 2012 and 2011, uh, 2012. So spent a couple of years with us. And you can see after graduated from um, Columbia, he um, went on to uh, research and consult consulting business, and uh, he founded that foundation. He's originally from uh, Venezuela and uh, pursued his undergraduate in Venezuela and United States and um, spent time in China, of course, and um, very much interest in China and has been doing research and, cons and consulting work related to China and Latin America. And so uh, very happy to welcome him back and to give us a talk on a very interesting topic. That's China and Latin America, a new assessment. Oh, by the way, my name is Xiao Bo Lu. I'm a political science professor here and also in charge of uh, the Marcy program when uh, Parsifal was a student uh, here. And I'm still in charge of that program. And um, welcome back, Parsifal. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Liu and, and uh, well, the weather Weatherhead Institute for having me back over you know a decade, uh, twelve years actually, um, since I graduated, and uh, I should also point out that Professor Liu was my uh, thesis advisor uh, back then for for my master's program. Um, I I initially thought about preparing a a presentation, but given that this is a very very broad topic. I thought it would uh, be better uh, to have more of an open-ended um, conversation. And so please feel free also for the people online to you know chip in if you have a comment or if you have a question, and I'll, I'll try to address it as best I, I can. So usually when I give these presentations, I begin with the following, that uh, Latin America, and especially Latin America and the Caribbean, this this idea, ever since it, the the term was coined over two hundred years ago in in Paris by a group of of Latin American um, intellectuals. Story the story is actually quite quite inter interesting. I'm very interested. I I, uh, I uh, suggest you you look it up. So ever since then, this this idea has actually never conceptualized. It's more of this toponym used in international relations and foreign policy analysis to take this eagle eye view of a very complex, diverse, heterogeneous um, uh, region. Um, we have, on the one hand, there's countries like Mexico, like Brazil, very large, populous countries um, that are uh, in a league of their own, you know, especially Mexico, given its its border with the United States, and uh, it has much less leeway in terms of its uh, decision making and foreign policy. Uh, Brazil is the main economy in the in the region. Um, a lot more leeway in, in decision making. Uh, it's an industrial hub, and yet it punches way. Uh, uh, below its weight when it comes to uh, geopolitical um, uh, decision making uh, and, and impact worldwide. Uh, you have the Caribbean that's often not uh, taken into account in these in these conversations. Uh, this is again also a a very diverse region with significant. Uh, colonial legacies, and it's very diverse culturally speaking. Um, Central America has, only Central America has seven countries. Um, South America, uh, putting Brazil aside, uh, 
uh, you have low income, middle income, high income countries. Uh, when it comes to uh, a political, uh, from a political standpoint of view, you have established dictatorships like the case of Cuba. You have these modern versions of leftist uh, uh, autocratic governments like Venezuela, and Nicaragua. You have nowadays you have El Salvador, which is a right uh, rightist um, uh, autocratic uh, government. So again, uh, to my initial point. If we are going to assess China's relationship with uh, this mismatch of countries, um, the answer and the assessment is going to depend a lot on uh, where you're standing. So the answer will be different if you're looking at this from the Caracas perspective or from San Jose or from Brasilia or for, from Santiago. And and, and this is, this is uh, I begin with this because... Uh, not only for because of the importance, but for two underlying reasons. The first one is that because of this uh, 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 dynamic um, within the region, the geopolitical decision making is very much not. It's it's very much aligned with domestic interests. There's no uh, the the region. And countries, uh, individu individually speaking, um, they, uh, they they very much pursue uh, domestic interests um, and are not aligned necessarily with uh, regional blocs uh, and much less uh, as a region as a whole. And the second reason is that China has increasingly become aware of this um, uh, diverse set of, 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 of point of views across the region. And uh, if we go back two decades ago, China did try to work a lot through regional organizations, uh, going from the most macro one, which is the, the community of Latin American Caribbean states, uh, CELAC, uh, by its uh, initials in Spanish, um, and a lot of now defunct uh, institutions like UNASUR that, that were uh, all these regional institutions uh, spearheaded by Venezuela back then, by, by its uh, uh, former uh, president Hugo Chavez, uh, and this was uh, the first so-called pink tide where, especially in the geopolitical realm, um, decisions became much more ideological uh, than practical, which was what had characterized the region uh, historically speaking, at least uh, throughout the 20th, the second half of, of, the, of the 20th century. Um, so... Uh, when we look at it from the, the, the PRC perspective, we have seen some important changes uh, because of this realization that uh, it's not that uh, these still existing regional organizations have been completely silent by China. They do still serve a purpose, but China has taken a much more uh, individual approach um, within the region. It's treating Brazil uh, as a separate partner because of, well, not only its economic weight, but also it's at least its aspirations to become a geopolitical player worldwide, especially through the BRICS um, um, bloc. Uh, Mexico, because of its proximity with the United States, because of the uh, North American trade agreement, it's, it's also a conduit uh to the to the US market so there's a lot of interplay there very a lot of specifics uh that differentiate China Mexico relations from the rest of the region um then of course you have the Central America and the Caribbean where most of Taiwan's uh, uh allies or remaining allies uh, uh are are uh, are based we have seen a strong push by the PRC over the last decade 
to uh, shift shift these alliances towards the PRC and 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 break off relations with uh, with Taiwan. Um, uh, I don't remember the exact number, but uh, over the last, I think the first one was Dominican Republic around 2015, more or less. And then you know by one by one by one they've been shifting recognitions. The latest Costa one, Rica. Uh, yeah, Costa Rica. The latest one was uh, Honduras. And odds sure. odds are that sometime this year, if not twenty twenty five, Guatemala will also will also change. Um, so uh, and, and one of the reasons is connected to my initial points. One of the reasons why Taiwan is still an issue in the Caribbean and in Central America is because of U.S. interests. Uh, from a, a pragmatic point of view, it it really doesn't make much sense for any of these countries, especially, especially taking into account uh, their small economies, to not have uh, diplomatic uh, relations with the second most you know the largest economy in the world. Um, and they played that card quite well. And there, there's been some countries that have been shifting back and forth. Um, so they do use uh, this, uh, their, uh, the, the, the Taiwan card as a negotiation tactic to, uh, see, to, to, uh, see what they can get out of, of, uh, uh, geopolitical rivalry between, between China and the United States. Um, and then we have, uh, um, it, it, South America, where I would, I would subdivide it. Well, as I mentioned, you know, you have Brazil on one side, but then you have uh, these the um, Andean countries. So Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, Bolivia, and Peru, which are uh, very similar in in their um, economic complementarity uh, with with China. Basically, these are natural resource powerhouses uh, that uh, even before China's uh, uh, rise in the, in the 21st century, uh, were still very much dependent on, uh, before this was the United States, before that it was uh, the United States and, and, and Europe. So these have been countries that historically haven't been able to diversify uh, their, their economic uh, output. Um, and China is just the latest uh, 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 player in that dynamic. Um, then you have uh, it, the southern cone, where primarily it's Chile and Argentina. Argentina is another country that uh, that has historically, because of domestic issues, uh, uh, been play, been hidden below its weight, uh, but it's still a, a very important uh, producer of of agricultural goods and nowadays obviously you know lithium is is it's it's become to the forefront there's huge investments coming from the PRC in that sector as well as in 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 uh in Chile um and uh, well it also uh, these the countries of South America uh, also have a lot more leeway in terms of how they handle um uh, US China tensions and uh, you would think this is this is actually quite an interesting point that um, given the, the uh, how the disunity of the region, um, you would think, and this is actually a popular narrative, especially in Washington, that countries, especially in South America, tend to, you know, play, the game uh, between the U.S. and China to get the best out of 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 these of these tensions, uh, but the the picture is actually quite more um, uh, complex. There's a recent study uh, published by a Spanish uh, research institute called uh, the Royal Institute Elcano. It's based in Madrid. Uh, this was published in in February. Uh, this early February this year, and they did an analysis on um, the decisions taking at uh, the UN by Latin America begin uh, in the two decades beginning in um, 2001 to 2023 in specific topics, uh, and they divided them into two camps. One is 
uh, the values camp. So here are human rights, territorial integrity, labor issues. And on the other uh, um, uh, camp, we have economics. Uh, so tariffs, economic sanctions, uh, that sort of thing. And uh, with the exception of Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela, uh, the, the, the autocracies of the region, if we, we take them out of the equation, Latin America and the Caribbean, by and large, in the values camp, always votes with the United States and the and the European Union. Over 90% of the time, these were over 31, 32 votes that they analyze. And uh, in most cases, it's at least over, over 90 or at least over 80% correlation between how Latin American countries vote at the UN uh, in contrast to uh, United States, European Union, as one block and China on the other hand. But when it comes to uh, the economic camp, over 90% of the time, they voted with China. Um, and uh, a, a good example of this is the, the, the war in Ukraine where by and large, again, putting Cuba, uh, Nicaragua, and Venezuela aside, they they have been ideologically aligned with China and and particularly more than Russia than China in uh, in these issues. Uh, so by and large, they they voted uh, with. Uh, sorry, talking about the 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 Ukraine war when uh, Russia first invades Ukraine, uh, the first vote that takes that takes place at the UN. Um, over, I think it was 92, 93 percent of countries uh, voted to uh, uh, voted against uh, Russia and criticized the invasion, and the rest, uh, the the rest six seven percent uh, abstained from voting. But move ahead to economic sanctions. Uh, again, the same number, but in this case, uh, opposing economic sanctions on Russia. Um, so it's it's interesting that when it comes to uh, to human rights, to territorial integrity, uh, there is a lot alignment in terms of values between Latin American countries and the West uh, uh, as uh, as a block. Uh, but and and well, there's a lot of studies on this. There's no there's no uh, uh, conclusion. Uh, really depends on how you address it. Uh, Probably because of its uh, the huge influence that the U.S. has played in the region over the last a uh, hundred years, uh, and given its own history of of intervention in the region, especially throughout the Cold War, um, Latin American countries are very much allergic when it comes to uh, economic sanctions and territorial integrity, which are often you know talking points that we see from Beijing. So there's an alignment when it comes to economics, but still, despite all its uh, all the flaws that we see across the region in terms of institutions, uh, democracy is still viewed as an important tenet of international relations, and as aspirationally speaking, it's something that it's still, you know, pretty much ingrained uh, into the populace, into uh, the um, into the state into institutions so uh, moving on to to the the competition between between China and the United States uh if we take that point of departure the US has huge leverage uh when it comes to influence in the region because of these cultural and uh, uh, value-based links, not to mention that you know the United States is, has the largest, you know, outside uh, um, outside Mexico is the largest Spanish-speaking population in the world. So there, there's family ties, there's cultural ties, uh, and even at the government level, there's still a much more alignment when it comes to to uh, democratic institutions and uh, and. Uh, um, you know, values uh, in 
at a regional level when it comes to what governments, the, the talking points of governments are usually based on democratic values. They're not, they do not see, they do not see China or autocratic governments as a viable model, even though if nowadays, you know, democracy has, has, has been, uh, let's just say, not delivering as much as it promised. And then it's, it's, um, uh, there's a lot of skepticism. You know, El Salvador is a good case where, you know, the strongman rule is seen as a possible alternative. But by and large, still, most surveys point that uh, still uh, democracy is is the way to go um, uh, across the region, with the exceptions of these two countries that are still, you know, their populace is still pushing back against their uh autocratic governments. So moving on to wh where we are today, um, I would like to begin with how China's diplomatic corps and foreign policy towards the region uh, has evolved to, to where we are today. If we go back 20 years, uh, China's diplomatic corps in the region uh, was pretty much subpar. Uh, it wasn't important. It, it wasn't an important region uh, within the, 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 the foreign policy establishment in Beijing. Uh, there were there's a lot more historical ties with Africa, obviously with with its periphery, Southeast Asia. Uh, so Latin America was very far outside the scope of of uh, uh, political decision making in, in China. This obviously starts to change uh, at the beginning of the 20th century with China's accession to the WTO. Um, and uh, it, Latin America becomes to, at least from an economics perspective, starts to take a lot more uh, um, weight uh, in, um, in China's uh, foreign policy. There's this, uh, I always uh, mentioned there, uh, this anecdote um, this took place around 2000 and this was in 2000 and 2004, 2005. Uh, then president of the the uh, China uh, Development Bank, uh, his name was Chen Hua. He was the, the, the person in charge of basically transforming the institution into this large uh, international uh, financial institution. And uh, he took a trip to Cuba. Uh, back then, you know, Cuba, because of, again, ideological and historical reasons, uh, was basically the only government that um, had close ties with Beijing. And the uh, reason why Tsien Hua went, uh, went to La Habana and, you know, sat down with, uh, with Fidel Castro and told him about his plans, about, you know, he, what he wanted to do, that they wanted to use economic leverage and loans uh, to expand uh, the the participation of, of Chinese companies uh, worldwide. And uh, um, during this conversation, Castro tells Chen Hua that if he had heard of Hugo Chavez in, in Venezuela, he had not. And... Um, to use his phrase, he describes uh, Castro describes Chavez as the new Simon Bolivar of, of of Latin America, the new liberator, and that he should talk to him. Uh, six six months later, uh, Chavez was in Beijing, um, meeting with uh, then President Hu Jintao. Chen Hua was obviously there. Six months afterwards, uh, China and Venezuela signed their first bilateral agreement for oil for loans, which uh, basically served as the, the stepping stone for an expansion of PRC involvement throughout the region. Um, so there was an important ideological aspect to these initial steps uh, or inroads into Latin America. But that pretty much uh, changed over the course of the next 10 20 years. Uh, nowadays, uh, even Cuba plays much less of a role in, in China's relation with the region. Uh, Venezuela, because of, well, the implosion of its economy, the social and political crisis, uh, has also lost a lot of leverage and importance for China. Um, and 
the PRC is not is now uh, much better situated from a political, from an and from an economic standpoint of view, and basically tr uh, has its own individual relationship with most countries in the region. Um, initially, Cuba and Venezuela per played an important role. These large institutions that I mentioned earlier also were conduits to engage the region as a whole. But I think along the way, uh, this was an important learning curve for Chinese companies, for the Chinese government. They understood that uh, trying to work through these regional blocks uh, was not paying as much dividends as they thought they would. And uh, nowadays we see a very much diverse, uh, complex and uh, um, and individual approach to countries uh, across Latin America. Um, and then and and this has also looking at from the Latin American perspective because of what I mentioned earlier, uh, these the the way that China is viewed, uh, I'm generalizing here, but it's it's usually viewed as a an economic opportunity. Um, the political aspect of it, the whether China is an autocracy or or a democracy or whatever, it, it doesn't. It, it's not a variable that is taken into account. Um, this has a lot to do with the the uh, the lessons from the Cold War. Um, that w during the Cold War, uh, Latin America did choose a side, at least most of it did, uh, aligning mostly with the United States. This had a lot of pros and cons, but well, that's that's a different story. And um, so, the it's 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 it puts Latin American countries in kind of this tough position, precisely because there's the huge impact that the Venezuelan crisis has had in the region and the the uh, influence that. Cuba, the overlarged influence that Cuba has, has played in uh, in uh, political movements across the region that go against the democratic values that most countries hold. Um, while some countries do choose to pay attention to the economic, the political situation in Venezuela and in Cuba and in Nicaragua, uh, China is viewed through a different lens. So it really doesn't matter uh, that, that, that China is an autocracy. It, it, it's, it is viewed as a, through a realist uh, lens of great power politics. So in, in this worldview, China and the United States are exactly the same. World powers act as world powers regardless of their system of government. Um, Again, I'm generalizing here, but if we look at decision making across the region over the last 20 years, this is this is the 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 you can uh, uh, accurately accurately you know draw those conclusions given the actions that that countries have taken. Um, uh, if we look at uh, you know Brazil, part of the BRICS, but it's still uh, and and it, it engages with Russia, it engages with China, but it still pushes for um uh regional integration and pushes for regional blocks that promote democratic values um so it's 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 not as a black and white as it's usually uh as it's usually portrayed in analysis and in in, in media coverage going back to so uh, chinese diplomatic corps um nowadays if not all of them, most of Chinese ambassadors and well, they're all men, of course, and uh, they all speak Spanish fluently or Portuguese in case of of, of Brazil. Um, there's a large presence in the Caribbean. They have extensive. Uh, they have more diplomatic representation in the Caribbean than the United States does, which is just mind boggling. Um, and 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 we can draw several conclusions from this. Well, one that Latin America has become much more important in Chinese foreign policy making. Um, on the one hand, you have obviously natural resources, but on the other hand, because of you know Taiwan's presence in the region, that's that's also this is also a a a, um, 
an important domestic issue in China that is tied to the region. Uh, so that's one of the other reasons why we've seen a lot more diplomatic, diplomatic engagement in Central America and in the Caribbean, uh, which is something that is welcomed, uh, frankly. If you look at, just to give one example, uh, late last year, the Prime Minister of Barbados went to China and she was received with, given the red carpet treatment, uh, was given a platform to speak. Um, and, uh, you know, when was the last time a U.S. president you know, visited the Caribbean? Um, so, and these are countries that um, are, um, while culturally tied to the United States, that they they still have a lot of especially infrastructure problems where, you know, China is quite well suited to to uh, address these problems. And that that's usually their main talking points when uh, when they uh, engage with Caribbean countries. They talk about disaster alleviation. They talk about telecommunications infrastructure. Um, and this is something that is, frankly, you know, well, well received, especially when there is no alternative uh, um, uh, coming from the United States or any other you know, uh, uh, important player within Latin America or 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 uh, um, or outside of it. Um, and and uh, another important aspect is that uh, the days of you know Chinese ambassadors and consuls not taking part in the local conversation is is behind us. Nowadays, ambassadors are much more proactive. They engage with the local population. You see every just you know right now uh, during the the Lunar New Year, you know, there's celebrations across the region promoted and sponsored by the Chinese embassy. And you always see the the ambassador there. Uh, uh, engagement. There is a lot of coordination with Confucius Institutes, a lot of engagement with local decision makers. Uh, we see a lot of meetings between the ambassador and um, uh, local representatives, be them congressmen, be them governors. Uh, they meet with uh, the private sector. So this this wasn't the case 20 years ago. This, is, this has been evolving. Um, initially, another important change has been that uh, this doesn't mean that, that, that it's still not the preferred approach, the state to state approach. It's still, let's just say, the 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 it's usually the first way, uh, uh, the first door they knock. Usually, try to establish some sort of high level. Um, uh, conversation to talk about bilateral relations. Um, this obviously works better in where in countries where decision making is concentrated, so autocracies, and also in democracies, especially in small countries where the, the decision making because of of the the uh, the nature of the the small state is also concentrated in a small group of people it's it's uh, it's usually the the main conduit used to engage these countries the other side of that coin is that given that in a lot of countries this the approach didn't work because either because there are strong democratic institutions that do not allow them uh, to to engage this way um it has been more of a bottom up approach so they have engaged the private sector uh nowadays while there's still a strong uh participation in uh, the extracting industries we've seen a shift towards merger and acquisitions in uh, in the service sector uh especially the whole ecosystem of uh, ICT, information and communications technology. You know, Huawei is has a huge presence in the region. They they work with basically every large telecom provider across Latin America. Uh, not only in the infrastructure, telecommunications infrastructure, but also uh, uh, in uh, IT such as clouding. Uh, they they work when I when they engage the, the private sector. They they set up infrastructure for banks. Uh, for um, uh, regional scale uh, uh, distribution uh, companies, um, and and you know Huawei, while it's 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 one of the largest player, is obviously but you know by far not the only one. 
Um, and uh, it, it, we do see a lot of coordination between uh, the state-owned enterprises, private companies. You know, the the Chinese embassies are very active, and and they work. Uh, in practice, they sort of work like these lobbying firms uh, to help Chinese, especially big players, uh, enter the local government. So it's usually when when you see uh, a, um, uh, I'll give you one example uh, throughout the pandemic, um, uh, Latin America, at least the first, the first and second wave of vaccines over ninety percent of it came from China. The um, this was a huge PR win for the PRC, and they made the best out of it. And you always saw uh, uh, I, there was this this PR stunt that I thought was, you know, uh, off the charts. Uh, the the president of uh, um, what was the the company called uh, for Sinovac um, has a name, right? Uh, it's not Sinovac. Or Cushing. Oh yeah, well, um, the, the the president of of uh, the manufacturer of, of the Sinovac vaccine uh, went to Buenos Aires and uh, he they, they he met with Messi and you know Messi gave him a this signed uh, uh, um, jersey and this was all over the Argentine media uh, and it was it, obviously it was the the CEO of a Chinese pharma company. With you know one of the most popular you know uh, of figures uh, of even outside of sports worldwide, and uh, uh, Messi was there when you know China was was uh, given uh, um, a donation. I don't remember of how many uh, vaccines, but uh, this speaks a lot to the, the 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 how much they've learned over the last twenty years of what m makes not only local governments tick, but also how to engage the local population. Um, and it, it, there's, there's an important thing that, that, that is worth highlighting here, that even though that they, they have learned a lot and they have diversified their, their approach, when we compare it to United States, uh, there's still, if, if there was ever a competition, you know, China started, oh, I don't know, a thousand miles uh, behind, precisely because of what I mentioned earlier. Because the, the, when when uh, uh, a young graduate from a uh, university in, in in Bogota or in Lima, they 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 pretty much uh, they, they aspire either to work for some Western company, either that Western or, or large conglomerate based in Latin America with links to the West to the United States. They come by droves to the United States to study. Uh, you know, Spain is a huge destination for for Latin American grad students and undergrads as well. Um, and not that many people. So like, I'm, 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 I spent ten years, eight years in China. I, I can tell you for a fact that our community there is 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 not is not as large, and it, um, it has it has remained rather small because of you know uh, language barriers, cultural barriers, uh, the distance. So, uh, and and this is uh, uh, speaking from a Washington perspective is uh, a huge loss opportunity. You know, uh, the U.S. has because uh, well, for reasons that you're all f familiar with, from uh, um, 9/11 onwards, uh, you know, Latin America just basically, you know, dropped out of the map. Uh, um, even though that at a private level, uh, there's the 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 curve hasn't stopped growing. So the participation of venture capitalists from the United States, it's it's there's no competitor uh, for U.S. venture capital in Latin America. There simply isn't. Even though that that uh, foreign direct investment from the China has been increasing as well, there's it's dwarfed by any comparison with the United States and in and in second instance from the from the European Union. Um, um uh, so 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 the mix the, the picture as you can see is quite mixed. Uh it, China has increasingly gain a foothold its footprint is 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 uh 
uh, has hasn't stopped growing, um, but it still has a lot of way to go. And uh, if we are talking about its <laughs> level of influence, even though it's investing a lot in um, in PR campaigns, there's there's a, there has been an increase in um, the uh, the contract the content sharing agreements between Latin American uh, um, media outlets and PRC state owned media outlets. Uh, CGTN is on is on you know Directv and a bunch of 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 uh, there's a, you see a lot of content of China produced content in um, especially in state owned uh, media outlets but also in private ones um, and uh, my, to my my last point and then I'll I'll, I'll, I'll uh, be happy to talk about anything in particular you guys are interested in. Um, the level of, of this, despite the large level of participation, uh, what I mentioned about uh, an increasing number of uh, PRC content uh, being consumed in the region, um, there is still a lot of uh, underlying uh, biases uh, against the PRC. Uh, there's still these. Um, it's it's the China as the manufacturing hub of the world, low class products is still uh, quite present in the region, but it's there's there are important shifts taking place, at least with younger generations. So uh, and especially in the tech sector. So even if, if you see the talking points that, that China tries to get across the region, be it at a state to state level or through these content sharing agreements or the op-eds that uh, ambassadors and consuls uh, regularly publish in local media, it's usually you know portraying China as a part of the global South, as a viable partner, as a friend, as someone that understands where these countries are coming from, when it talks about colonialism and the uh, the the legacies of of U.S. imperialism, so it 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 tries to connect, especially with leftist talking points. Uh, but uh, they do try to reach out. It's it's kind of they're very much regime agnostic. They will deal with. Uh, Democrats, autocrats, and everything in the middle, um, and but usually the message; it, those are the, the 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 key talking points. Uh, we understand you. We are a part of the developing world. Uh, we do not get involved in your internal affairs, and uh, these are more than talking points. If if you look at engage with the region, it is pretty much aligned with their their um. Uh, their narrative. Um, um, and uh, I lost my turn of, uh, my, my train of thought here. Um, well, basically to to conclude, um, oh yes, yeah, I remember uh, uh, younger generations. that image of China as the the factory of the world uh, is changing in the uh, the 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 younger generations, especially from a tech perspective. And that is, I think, that is one of the talking points that we see a lot coming out from Chinese outlets in Spanish and Portuguese. They they often promote, uh, you know, the drone industry or, uh, well, Huawei's presence. Uh, um, so they want to position themselves as a tech powerhouse. Um, and nowadays, you know, you know, Xiaomi, Huawei, uh, honor. Uh, these are brands that, in some cases, people don't even know they're, they 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 do come in China, but they are considered as top tier. Um, uh, the the um, the space the the Chinese the PRC space agency. This is something that also was replicated uh, when when the 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 rover landed on the moon. So, I think if we're when it comes to influence, you know, values, human rights, uh, that in that sphere, 
uh, if the PRC wants to 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 get into it, I, I don't think they're they're winning, and it's it's pretty uh, it's pretty obvious when their talking points uh, fall into the propaganda camp. Uh, but when it comes to tech, uh, the tech sector, I think that's where where we will see shifting perspectives from uh, from uh, uh, younger generations and the ones that are coming uh, uh, that are coming afterwards. Thank you very much. So there's a lot to talk about there. Right. <laughs> so actually, I already have uh, some questions online also. But let me ask you first a uh, question, and then I'll uh, read out the um, question that raised by Andy Nathan. Uh, it's a very good question. So the first question I want to ask is that uh, it's about the investment structure. You mentioned a couple times about the uh, big companies like Huawei and Xiaomi and those uh, in telecommunications and so on in recent years. I wonder beyond and besides that, uh, whether China's investment, uh, because if we look at other other places like Africa, for example, right? You have infrastructure projects as a part of this Belt and Road. You have a mention about Belt and Road. Uh, I wonder if China also has some infrastructure projects in Latin America overall. Um, and also any private company, I guess, Huawei and others, but any small investment, which we find a lot in, say, Africa. You know, a lot of Chinese private companies, small companies, they go to Africa, diff all different countries to invest. Uh, this is besides and beyond the big infrastructure projects that state usually sponsor or state companies. I wonder if Latin America has that kind of a, you know, a similar kind of presence of Chinese investment or not. You know, that's, I guess, the basic question is, what about, you know, beyond the trade relationship, what the Chinese kind of investment structures like in Latin America? You see some growing, some, you know, some sure. areas. Um, okay, that, that's, that has been an important shift or uh, over the last two decades. So throughout the 2000s, especially the second half, uh, there was this huge, push for infrastructure development. Um, it doesn't mean that it's still not taking place. It is. Uh, the I think probably the, the best example for this is the Chiang Kai port in Peru, which is going to be the largest seaport in Latin America. It's huge. It's been, but, but the thing is, it has been marred by controversies of corruption, and 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 and, and delays, and, and it's had a lot of problems. But it is finally uh, being inaugurated later this year. Xi Jinping already announced that he was going to go for the inauguration. This is going to be a huge splash, uh, uh, for sure. Um, and you you will see this for sure, and then you know the top headlines of the Jungo Rubao, and 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 then. so they'll use this both domestically as well as internationally. Um, and but the thing is. Uh, and and this is this is a, a very a personal view on, on on the issue, but I think Venezuela played an important part in uh, their risk assessment strategy, especially when it comes to large infrastructure projects. Um, there's a bunch of them. If you, if you look at 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 all the the proposed inf large infrastructure projects in the late 2000s, early 2010s. There was supposed to be a corridor uniting the uh, um, the Pacific with the Atlantic Ocean from um, uh, Brazil uh, going going uh, all the way to, to the Chilean coast. Uh, there was also one proposed through Argentina. There was the Nicaragua Canal. Um, Venezuela was supposed to have the first uh, bullet train of the region. These, these, and and this has a lot to do with one of those points I made that that uh, engaging at a level, government to government or state to state uh, level. Uh, in Venezuela's case, it was because of this basically obscure uh, mechanism of engagement where there was no participation from local institutions and even in the 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 oversight of these these uh, funds. Venezuela to this date is still the largest loan portfolio China has ever had uh, globally. Um, not even Pakistan is. Uh, um, uh, but again, this these were loans that stopped in 2017. It was the last uh, the last trench that was offered to Venezuela, um, and this was 65 billion dollars in loans. 
and China has basically nothing to show for it. This is not hyperbole. Uh, the, the 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 Venezuelan uh, experiment was a huge failure uh, from a from a China perspective. Doesn't mean that they they didn't get something uh, in exchange. You know, as I explained earlier, Venezuela was a a great platform to extend uh, engagement with political circles, with uh, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, regional scale uh, organizations. Uh, but Venezuela. The Venezuela of the late 2000s, the level of of geopolitical influence it had was the most important attraction for for the PRC. That that is basically gone nowadays. And given that all that money, the Venezuela was supposed to be the pinnacle of engagement. They were, you know, the first bullet train. Uh, uh, um, the green sector was supposed to 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 be a, the, a huge boost. Um, the oil and gas, you know, Venezuela, largest oil reserves in the world was supposed to be producing uh, by the by 2015 over six, seven million uh, barrels of oil per day. And it collapsed to, you know, 1920 levels. Um, so I think there was an important lesson for for the way to understand that even if you have a level of connection with uh, the 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 executive of whatever country that doesn't guarantee results. Uh, it's uh, countries with um, with uh, a very poor record in rule of law. Uh, I think it's something that they've started to over the last decade have started to take into account. So, uh, going back to so what what happened with all these large infrastructure projects, um. They uh, even, you know, there was sort of a little uh, uh, boost when the BRI was announced in 2013. And but the thing is, all these projects were already there. This this was a rebranding. And, and I thought for, for those of you who have, who have studied BRI projects and, and uh, um eh, that's it's it's more of a branding strategy. And, and, and suddenly everything became BRI. Uh, there's a lot. Uh, I don't remember the the number of of countries that have signed onto the BRI in Latin America, but it's I think it's close to if it's not twenty, it's close to twenty. So there's a lot of countries. So that's over like sixty five, seventy percent of the countries. Um, but again, these are MOUs. Um, well, if, other than you know uh, a a uh, comment by some U.S. official, there's there's really no downside to signing onto the BRI. And it's sort of seen like a, you know, a gesture of, of goodwill towards the PRC in terms of engagement, but uh, in practical terms, it 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 it's it's why wouldn't you you sign on to the BRI? Um, but then you have cases like Brazil. You know, it's part of the BRICS. It has a, a, an important political relationship with the PRC, and it's not part of the BRICS. So. If everyone is part of BRICS and it really doesn't, you know, influence your your economic relationship, it it's it's um uh, it's a non-issue or close to a non-issue. Um, so it, it the it doesn't mean that infrastructure projects have become uh um less important. There's still an important participation, especially by state-owned enterprises. Um, but we've seen an important shift. Very important shift in terms of mergers and acquisitions. This was something that, if you go back to 2015, they they, they basically weren't they didn't exist, uh, and they're usually uh, in uh, the service sector, um, service slash infrastructure. Because I'll give you a couple of examples in uh, Argentina and in uh, and in um, in Chile and in Peru as well. Uh, there were important uh, acquisitions in the uh, electric sector uh, at a time where a lot of European and U.S. companies were pushing out of the re were, were were exiting the region. So it was seen as an opportunity to get some important assets um, in in those in those sectors. Um, there's still a lot of 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 uh, uh, roads. There's still a lot of participation in the expansion of ports. Um, but all those grand projects that we saw throughout the 2000s, early 2010s, have basically, uh, you know, disappeared from from the headlines.
All right, so here, uh, Andy Nathan, you know, uh, Nathan, Professor Nathan, said, thank you. This is a very informative presentation. Unfortunately, I have to leave for previous deployment. I'd like to ask here, ask some questions. What are Chinese military interests in LA, if any? Right, that's the first question in, in the military interest. How large is the Chinese diaspora community in Latin America? And if Beijing, does Beijing engage in any transnational repression in Latin America? So three questions. Military interests in LA, or, and uh, second question is, uh, how large is the Chinese diaspora community in Latin America? And does if what does the Beijing engage in transnational repression? Um, sure, okay, so military interests. Um, there has there has been some some military engagement, uh, but it's it's basically dwarfed by a, by the security relationship that exists between local militaries and the United States. You do see some training programs, uh, uh, but these are mostly concentrated in um, the in autocratic governments. So you see. A, personnel from the Venezuelan military, the Cuban, the Nicaraguan, visiting China for, for training. There are also some programs uh, uh, throughout the region, but they're, they're, I wouldn't say insignificant, but, but they're, they're pretty small uh, by um, any, any sort of comparison with the United States or even the European Union. Um, I guess the most important interest is probably in um, uh, the south pole and uh, the the routes the the maritime routes um the, there's been a lot of controversy around a um a uh, space uh, uh observatory in argentina uh in the patagonia um that uh this was this was constructed back in the late uh 2000s and it's um, well, depends on who you talk to. Uh, there's a lot of versions around this this uh, this campsite uh, where, uh, well, a local personnel local uh, personnel is not allowed. Uh, local Argentine personnel is not allowed in the installations. So there's there there is uh, PRC um, um, uh, military officials based there as well. Um, but there is no indication that they're using this for other purposes other than uh, space observation. Um, this was something that uh, the previous, uh, well, two presidencies ago, uh, Macri in Argentina tried to renegotiate with the PRC, but uh, there was strong pushback uh, by China. Uh, they, they, they even... Um, um, they pointed to some quote unquote problems with uh, Argentine's uh, soy uh, exports if these these this contract was renegotiated. So the, there was some economic coercion there by the PRC. Um, but again, generally speaking, there's very little engagement at a military level. Uh, Take a long question. So you, you mentioned Argentina's case. So it's, what about the end of the new uh, president, the right-wing uh, populist melee? Melee really made yeah. it clear that he wanted uh, China out. So. Yeah, but but I think he's he's just, he bumped into reality. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, re um, election rhetoric is one thing. Yeah, he was very pretty harsh. But the thing is, it's it's something that was usually, uh, his case is quite interesting because one thing that was usually missed is that this wasn't specifically against China. This was actually more uh, talking about Latin American autocracies. And the thing that he put, you know, the whole leftist world in one bucket. Um, so for him, uh, again, this was... Uh, uh, rhetoric during the election season, he put uh, I don't know Venezuela, uh, Lula in Brazil and China and Russia all in the same bucket. So it was more yeah. about ah oh, well Petro of course yeah. Um, so it was again and nowadays just yesterday the the foreign minister uh, from Argentina met with uh, with, with Wang Yi yeah. I noticed that. 
So yeah, I only think a few people that he met, and including Argentina for yeah. that. Yeah. So, so it, yeah, and no, Argentina is very it's 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 quite important nowadays, especially because of the lithium industry, um, and 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 uh, and, and <laughs> yeah, well, soybeans, uh, you know, the South America's largest um, a solar power plant is in 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 uh, in Argentina. Um, um, uh, yeah, mess, yeah. Oh, wow, that was, mess too. Oh, man, that was a huge mess in Hong Kong, <laughs> and they, they they also they canceled this match in in in, well, in, in Beijing March. In, in March, yeah. Yeah, it was, yeah it's so. too friendly uh, schedule. You didn't know this? Or you look a little oh, surprised. I, I, I agree. Oh, Messi, Messi uh, was at Hong Kong. He didn't play. He said he's sick. And the next three days later, he played in in Tokyo. This is with uh, with Inter 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 Miami, and uh, so it was caused a huge pushback from the from China. initially Hong Kong, but also Chinese mainland. So they're basically saying you're kind of like whatever the reason. But anyway, so but the good thing is so far Melee hasn't made any. <laughs> any that was really fine. I think this yeah. is hopefully going to be happening. But anyway, so um, okay. So second point, uh, uh, Chinese fun. diaspora. It's it's there is an important diaspora, but it's focused uh, in a few countries. Mm. So Peru has a very large Chinese community. Uh, Central America. Mm. Um, the thing is, uh, obviously, there's given uh, the 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 history of diplomatic representation between you know the PRC and Taiwan in Central America. Um, th there's a lot. There's a large Taiwanese community as well. So, and and this uh, this has been changing, and and uh, and frankly, uh, there's they're all put in the same bucket, and even uh, diasporas from Southeast Asia are in sometimes considered as Chinese, and th th this, uh, yeah, this well, uh, mm -hmm. it's uh, it has a lot to do with uh, you know biases and and uh, uh, and frankly, you know, racism in in the region. Uh, yeah, the El Chino. You know, it's um, um, but the thing is, uh, these the these countries and 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 these all date back, you know, two hundred years. You know, from when from the there was Chinese labor, yeah, and there was Chinese labor in the Panama Canal. Um, um, so there are important communities that are uh, uh, binational. And even though you've had an influx of PRC nationals over the last twenty years because of the you know increasing participation of these companies, um, and the the uh, well, one one important case you know Venezuela Venezuela at one point had over six hundred thousand uh, PRC nationals. This is late two thousands, um, and they a lot of them basically left with the Venezuelan migration. Uh, but they date back to the 60s and 70s, where there was a large influx from uh, southern China, uh, primarily Guangdong, oh. um, um, that took place, you know, 60s and 70s. So th there are there are uh, important communities, but you know, Chile ha has none, uh, Argentina has none, Brazil does have an important community, but it's more mixed. Uh, you have a lot of Japanese, a lot of Koreans, uh, as well. Uh, but you know Peru for sure, Central America, Colombia has none, none whatsoever. Um, so it's it's focused on on, on specific countries. Um, Guyana, for some uh, research that I found out recently, does have an important uh, uh, you know P uh, Chinese heritage. Uh, uh, yeah, so all the countries you know east of of Venezuela, uh, also for colonial reasons. Um, so yeah, it's and it's quite diverse because they've become part of the 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 local community. They're not seen as foreigners, but this obviously is is it's very uh, uh, it's an ongoing social melding that that, that takes place. Um, and uh, transnational repression, uh, we uh, this is something that is definitely understudied. Um, we know for a fact this this is something the study that we've been uh, carrying at our organization recently, and there is an increasing number of 
United Front re, uh, related organizations across Latin America. Uh, just to give you one example, uh, um, in El Salvador, there was this meeting that took place um, uh, late last year. And um, I don't remember the name of the organization, uh, but it's one of the main international fronts of the United Front. And uh, this was obviously sold as an exchange between the El Salvadorian Chinese community and the Salvadorian government, and it was sponsored by them. Um, and uh, uh, I recently was talking with a, uh, a reporter from Guyana, and uh, she was telling me that it's because of this huge boom in the oil sector uh, that that's been taking place over the last couple of years, and there has been a huge influx of of PRC state-owned enterprises in the oil and gas sector. Um, that these new communities that have been coming to the country have been pushing out the ones that been have been established there for decades, uh, um, and um, uh, and this is something that is we've also detected in Suriname. Um, uh, Venezuela is full of of, of United Front uh, organizations, all these friendship associations, uh, and there are they, they are basic. I was there a few months ago. They're basically bunkers uh, and very well uh, um, um, protected. Which you know, why would a, a a friendship group association need such a a protected, um, um, you know, infrastructure. Um, but the thing is, it's uh, uh, when uh, oh, well, there's one more case when the uh, last year when um, this report came out of the police stations in the EU, especially in 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 Germany. Um, uh, there were some cases reported in Peru, uh, also because police. Uh, uh, stations surveilling the local Chinese community. Again, and I, I don't see this as as something uh, comparable to what you see in Southeast Asia or in Australia, um, uh, but it it's definitely understudied. So if there are more activities taking place, uh, but I frankly wouldn't know. All right. Let's uh, any questions. Okay. okay. Thank you. It's very, it's, it's a great talk. So I have two questions. You mentioned that um, the ambassadors are engaging more with the local affairs. I'm curious. And you also mentioned China uh, aligns with is like non-interference principle pretty well. I'm curious whether um, implicitly or explicitly those ambassadors would be involved in the local elections, um, like the, the local politics uh, perspectives. The second question is on towards the very end, you distinguish uh, the talking points by China on the ec economic side versus the value side. And you said on the value side is pretty much people see that as propaganda. I'm just curious how, uh, how you kind of differentiate how much pub, uh, the public are receptive to different narratives of China. Do you see that, that, do you see that different Chinese narratives are picked up by the local media differently? Or do you see that the polls uh, show different attitudes uh, about China on these different perspectives? Mm, thanks. Um, uh, so uh, your first question. Um, Sorry, could you, <laughs> that, uh, could you could you repeat it? Just, uh, so whether, whether the, the local ambassadors okay. Yes. So there are some cases, but uh, they are basically cherry picked, where ambassadors and consuls have gotten involved in at least trying to influence uh, elections uh, from a media perspective. Uh, they're mostly based in uh, in um, in Brazil. Um, the 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 the, the most uh, vocal case that I know was a few years ago. The ambassador, the consul to to Rio de Janeiro, was it had very close political ties with the local governor, um, and this was. 
before the last elections and there was a lot of let's just say political fighting between this was a potential uh presidential candidate uh very much opposed to Jair Bolsonaro at the time uh this was throughout the pandemic and uh, there was a lot of coordination to make uh, Rio de Janeiro like the hub for for um vaccine distribution and the first vaccines that arrived in region were were thanks to the political ties between then consul uh Chinese consul and the the governor of of uh of Rio de Janeiro um we do see them being a little bit more vocal but i don't uh, uh in, in local affairs but uh there are no polls on this so it our our best this is more of and speculative analysis uh, given the reach that the outlets that they publish in have. Um, and, and curiously enough, it depends a lot on the personality, uh, especially when it comes to ambassadors. Um, some ambassadors are very much, uh, they, 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 um, they don't like participating, or at least that's what we can, the conclusion that we draw from uh, the type of engagement that they have. Uh, very much coordinated, a press release they prepare their talking points they talk to the to the local media uh but they don't they don't let's just say they 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 they're, they're not known for their um uh, for being spontaneous but then you have on the other side uh you have uh, you have several ambassadors the one in Dominican Republic the one in Panama um his name is Wei Qiang and this guy's a rock star this this guy engages everyone uh he has a very good political network across uh, uh central america and he, he i'll give you one one anecdote that i think is quite telling so in back in 2019 i worked as a, a prc foreign foreign policy advisor for the venezuelan interim government and around that time basically what my job was to establish a uh, a back channel between the interim government and Beijing. Uh, we tried through a lot of different channels. Um, and uh, every single time that we tried approaching a, a Chinese embassy across the region, they they ran the other way. It was like they, they couldn't see us. They smelled us and they, 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 they started running. Um, but... The case of, of, of Panama, uh, Wei Tiang actually reached out to us. So uh, how, how did I, we interpret that? Is that there's a lot more leeway to the kind of activities that ambassadors have uh, when it comes to engagement. This probably has to do uh, with their hierarchy within the party. Uh, but uh, we do see them, you know, it, the personality uh, of the ambassador does play an important role in the time of engagement. And that is what we've seen um, uh, by taking a look of who they engage with and how they, how they do so. Um, and, um, okay, uh, so, and your second... About the value versus sales. Yes. Um, yes. Um, the thing is, the talking point about the the... the the general talking point coming out from Beijing uh, when it comes to uh, governance, they usually talk about democracy with Chinese character characteristics, right? So, and this is something that Bay A is no one knows what they're talking about when they talk about this, and B, uh, it's pretty much entrenched across society that it's government, uh, it's China is a one party. Uh, autocratic system. Uh, so everything that counters that uh, is usually perceived uh, uh, with uh, with uh, at least skepticism. Um, and there's sadly, there's no polls to support this. This is more of a, an organizational point of view that we've uh, we've gotten through, you know, talking to decision makers, policymakers uh, across the region. But let me also take along that question. So you mentioned uh, the Prime Minister of Barbados. Uh, when, you know, she was in China a couple of years ago. I think also that's interesting. It, when when you talk about value, I wonder if China now 
increasingly is regarded as the South, the speaker of the South, for whatever reason, you know, the South, the global South, in terms of anti-American he hegemony, right? That, see, that's what the Barbados prime minister came from. That, yeah. you know, in that in, in her case, it's not about human rights. She talked about this. She said, okay, we'll talk about human rights. All right. And so China, so basically saying, all right, if you ignore us, you know, like the United States West, then why can't we just go? It's economic, but it's a little bit more than just pure economic. There is that more independent stream of the South kind of thing. With China, that kind of, is that increasingly appealing to the Latin America countries? Specifically, I know that elsewhere in Africa, there are a lot of talk about that and that becoming increasingly interesting, shall we say. I'm not saying that China could uh, somehow gain more of higher, higher ground, but it's, I see that as, as a way, a lot of that, you can see that as a reaction, say, to uh, to the um, Israel, you know, kind of, so that, that kind of a conflict that they're seeing a kind of a, not anti-West, but certainly the other side. There's some alternative. Would that be also part of that appeal? Um, I mean, would that no, it, kind of appeal, appeal to... It the... is. Uh, but this has a lot to do uh, with what I was talking earlier about seeing China as a great power, regardless of its system That's of government. Uh, that being said... Um, there's no shortage of anti-Americanism across Latin America, especially uh, in the more extreme leftist circles. Uh, it's also true in academia. Um, um, and um, the there is an important connection. And uh, it's usually used, China's usually used uh, as a way to attack U.S. interventionism in the in the region, but it's a more geopolitical. Uh, that's that's why it's it's funny that they they might some leaders might use uh, 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 or might align with China uh, as part of this huge you know global South group, um, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, once. Uh, People get into office. It's like what they talk about, what they, how they address their populations. Um, that's uh, they 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 talk about. Um, uh, you know, they talk about the importance of democracy. They talk about the importance of institutions. They talk about human rights. They talk about uh, uh, protecting the environment. They talk. About... So that's why uh, they often choose not to talk about uh, PRC domestic issues. Because of the potential, they 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 know who uh, to a certain extent they do know who they're dealing with, um, but China is one of the most important economic engines of the region. So, uh, you might talk about human rights in Venezuela or in Cuba or in Nicaragua or any other country in the region, but you will not talk about human rights in China, because that will has the potential to backfire against the investment that China is having in the region. I wanted you to comment on nearshoring the opportunity for Latin America and what role is China playing in there as an ally, as a partner, as an investor? Okay, so the only country that is actually capitalizing on the the, the near shoring uh, of phenomena is Mexico. It's basically the only one. Uh, you do see some isolated cases uh, across South America, but generally speaking, in it's in, in my view something it's it's a huge lost opportunity um, for a lot of Latin American countries that given the fact that. There's always talk about diversifying the economy, about inserting themselves into manufacturing chains across the globe, and it's it's all words. It has actually never happened. The only countries that do have some important manufacturing hubs are Mexico and Brazil, uh, but still, Brazil is a very close economy, so it makes it very difficult. Um, and 
you know, Mexico is is you know trying to balance its plate here because of, of uh, well, all the sanctions that the U.S. has instated on on, on Chinese products, Chinese tech, um, but uh, at the same time, it there's a lot to play with uh, because as long as well, it, it depends specifically on the policy. This not not my area of expertise, but there are ways to get uh, Chinese partners, manufacturing partners, um, uh, to come to Mexico, especially in the auto industry. We've seen these important without they becoming and uh, you know the the majority partner of a company. So that would still classify as made in Mexico. So th I think they're 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 that's that's as much as I know about it. Uh, I know it's 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 uh, it's more more complicated than that, but we've we've seen some uh, some companies you know taking advantage of of uh, of the their access to the U.S. market uh, and not uh, completely uh, put Chinese manufacturers out of the picture. Um, and but other regions, you know, China. Uh, one important, uh, one potential sector for setting up manufacturing hubs is the the well the green industry as a whole, especially given that you know Bolivia has the largest lithium uh, reserves on earth, and they're <laughs> just I just read this recently they're manufacturing capacity is it's not zero but is almost zero because of domestic policies because they nationalized the entire industry they're not allowing not even the chinese to exploit the 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 lithium sector so uh, yeah it's it's how how you do not want to do things you know that's a way um but yeah argentina might be a case we'll we'll see where milay how Millet uh, treats this, but uh, uh, there's a, a large potential for setting up, you know, uh, battery manufacturing centers in, in in Argentina. Chile, I think, probably will be a case that uh, will take advantage of this. There's there's been some restrictions from the current government that that have made this difficult, uh, but uh, given uh, uh, you know. Chile's strong record in in uh, 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 open economic policy and, and and attracting foreign investors. I see something that possibly there uh, when it comes to to green energy and um, w w which is we'll, we'll see how how that's handled with the United States. I, I don't know. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I want to take advantage of uh, your current location, and I guess you have been involved with uh, Colombian affairs, Colombia with a no, <laughs> uh, for a long, even before you settled shop there. Um, the um, uh, is uh, Colombia, uh, the Colombian uh, Chinese relation, uh, and. Uh, an example or something that could be uh, a chapter in a case studies, and I'm particularly thinking on, on two issues. Uh, the uh, construction of uh, Bogota's uh, metro, and uh, but second, and, and this you might not like what I want to say, but uh, uh, the former president, Duque, playing uh, two games somehow, like Millet, but uh, with a we have better hair. <laughs> uh, when it comes to leftists in, in, in Latin America, because they were pa powerless and disgusting, uh, namely Maduro, uh, and eventually even uh, uh, Cuba and, 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 and the Ortega's, Ortega Somoza's regime, as I like to call them, uh, it, it was good to show your chest, your muscles. But when it came to China, Duque uh, paid a visit to China and was uh, praising, singing the praises of, of the communist system, but without without naming communism, singing the praises of China. The, the Colombia case is quite interesting because uh, Colombia is a latecomer to the China world. It's across Latin America, especially given the, the importance of, of, of the country in um, 
in regional dynamics and uh, its size. Uh, but when you compare it to Venezuela, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, most important neighbor. Um, it's, it's, Colombia didn't, um, uh, this goes for both sides. You know, we didn't see any outreach from the PRC side, none whatsoever coming from the Colombia side. So this started to change precisely during Duque's, uh, so, uh, Colombia's previous um, president, Ivan Duque, uh, we started to see a change. Uh, yes, uh, he visited uh, Beijing. Uh, and this is when we see uh, a, a shift or at least an intent of diversifying or focusing a little bit more on the Asia Pacific. From the, the the Colombian perspective, you know, Colombia is part of the the, um, uh, the uh, of the APEC, and uh, it's a block that definitely hasn't you know gotten a lot of traction. Uh, I was there in Beijing when they launched it, and yeah. it was, uh, you know, let's just say, it uh, uh, it left a lot to be desired. Um, and uh, but going back to Duque, yes, he, he visited, they signed a bunch of agreements. Uh, Duque was even, you know, being a traditional, a, a rightist a government um, in Colombia, uh, they even uh, had a draft for Colombia to join the BRI. Uh, it was, so, was supposed to happen with Petro, and it didn't. Uh, Petro just went uh, end of last year to, to Beijing, and there was a lot of talk about him you know, signing on to the BRI, and it didn't happen. They they elevated their their relationship to. I don't remember the the, the status was the first the first uh, uh, step on the on the the hierarchy of of uh, um, a, of the types of, of relationship that the PRC has, and uh, so for the last six seven years more or less. Um, Colombia has been looking more towards uh, the Asia Pacific, particularly China, but it's not only China. They they've they 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 have because of historical reasons they have a close relationship with South Korea. Um, they, we've seen more engagement with the Japanese, um, and uh, yes, the the Bogota Metro. And for just to give you a little bit of context, uh, Bogota is a city of eight million people that doesn't have a subway. And they've been trying to build that subway for four or five decades, and it always end up marred by corruption. The money got stolen. It, 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 yeah, yeah it, it never got off the ground till finally uh, there was this auction a few years ago. Uh, China Railway won the auction, and it's there have been some delays, but you know, to be honest, you know, the pandemic, everything, it was it was impossible not not the, the to. Uh, uh, for delays not to take place, but overall it's 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 advancing quite uh, quite on track. Um, so it, it, you cannot disconnect the close relationship be between Colombia and the United States from Colombia's relationship with China. You know, Colombia has historically been the most important ally of the United States in the region. Um, that uh, that for sure that played an important role in in, in um, why. Colombia never actually looked towards China, but it's been, I think it's pretty, pretty much pragmatic from initially Duque uh, and now, and now Petro to, to engage more with, with, with the Chinese. Uh, Petro, the, the, this, there was a lot of criticism, especially within the very, there's, there's a sector in, uh, in Colombia that is v within academia that is very pro China. And they criticized them extensively because they they thought that this visit was supposed to, you know, bring Colombia into the BRI and expand relationship. It didn't happen. Um, a lot of reasons why why I think that was the case, but it, it has to do a lot with the fact that Colombia has always been a very inward looking country, uh, and especially with everything that's going on with the the the, the peace process falling apart and. So China has a role to play, especially in infrastructure development, going back to, to, to your point uh, previously. So that's mostly where it's focused. And there's been a lot of problems. There was, you know, last year there was this uh, Zijin, the, the, the mining company, they actually, they left, they had a, the, 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 um, uh, uh, no, 
this was sorry, this was in Sydney. This was uh, a company called Emerald Energy, and uh, they had one of the uh, uh, licenses to exploit the largest gold mine in uh, in Colombia, and they walked out of it because there was a huge problem with the local community. A bunch of their their uh, um, managerial level got kidnapped, and they say, "Look, this is not worth it." And they broke contract. They left the country. So a lot of things going on there. So I think they're they're focusing more on the infrastructure side, trying to focus there. And um, Colombia is making the best out of it. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Have you back? Thank you.